So, okay, and to remember that can't advance by um, just using the arrow keys there. Okay, so um, where where I want to start is by framing um, some of the the issues and concerns that um, come up, as well as putting together just a few basic statistics. Um, because I'm, I'm realizing that with the audience, um, many of you are probably um, in individuals with autism or you are um, family members of people with autism. And so you um, uh, have varying uh, degrees of, of expertise here. Um, and then many of you will also be researchers and academics and whatnot. And so, you know, just to, and some of you might be fairly new to the topic of autism, but very interested in issues in criminal justice. So um, kind of leaning first towards um, that part of the crowd, um, let's talk about prevalence of autism. So autism is a, a very um, common uh, neurodevelopmental condition, uh, as many as one in 68 kids. Um, it's more common in boys than in girls. Um, occurs in all um, racial, ethnic, and, and socioeconomic status groups, you see quite a few inequities, um, especially around diagnosis and treatment. And those inequities are often um, grounded in the different levels of access to high quality healthcare. And that um, brings us probably to the first kind of um, intersection of, of autism and the legal system. And today, I'm, when I'm talking about legal system, I'm really talking about criminal law. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that <coughs> immediately comes up is that many individuals with autism um, are not receiving a diagnosis and they're not receiving treatment. And it's all too common for um, one of the um, most um, frequent places for uh, young adults with autism to begin to receive um, treatment and, and diagnoses late in the game um, is in a criminal justice setting. Um, and we'll get into that even more. And the individuals who are most likely to not um, be receiving high quality health care, um, people living in uh, rural areas, for example, um, Appalachian mountain areas, um, think about South um, Western Virginia, for example, um, and also in some of our major inner cities. Um, so you have pockets where um, people are, are really received. There might not be a single child psychologist, child psychiatrist um, in you know in the area many for many many miles, and as a result. Um, what an individual with autistic symptoms could be going quite far along um, in the educational system and really only um, start to receive proper health care because they get into trouble uh, or even more often are the victim of a crime. And so, um, and, and that's a, one of the positive outcomes <laughs> in those situations. Um, not to speak of the number of cases that are probably missed. Um, I think a lot of us in the field wonder just how many individuals there are um, in prison settings um, who would meet diagnostic um, classification for autism. And that's not to say that autism and crime um, co-vary in any way or that people with autism are more likely to commit crimes. It's very much the opposite. Um, much more likely to be the victims of crimes, but um, a lot of the things, um, a lot of the symptoms that present with autism, especially around socio-emotional development, um, are things that if you don't receive help for, um, could lead to um, you being um, in a situation where you're finding yourself in a criminal setting. So I'll come back to that. Um, in a moment. And I've already alluded to the fact that autistic people experience crime at rates much higher um, than individuals without autism. Um, and it kind of broadly defined individuals with developmental disabilities are about seven times more likely to have contact with the criminal justice system. Again, overwhelmingly 
um, as the victim uh, of crimes. So, um, sorry, I jumped over. Uh, along with those statistics, when you think about you know why is it that individuals with, uh, with autistic individuals are are often the victims of um, crimes? You know, one element of it is that we focus quite a bit, um, you know, very broadly in treatment on um, helping to helping a child to be compliant. And sometimes that in and of itself can be a feature that also makes them more likely to be a victim of a crime. You know, if you teach someone to, um, you know, you work really hard to help someone follow rules, but then someone takes advantage of that. Um, if the rules are listened to someone who seems like they have more experience or more knowledge in an area, and um, you have difficulty picking up on the social cues that yes, this person has more knowledge and experience, but they, they're also not um, a person with good intentions, then um, it can be very easy to either um, go along with you know, a crime in progress or to um, be the actual victim of that crime. And then of course, um, many individuals with autism also have um, cognitive disabilities, uh, intellectual disability, and also specific patterns of strengths and weaknesses within um, different domains of cognition. And so you know, to think about that in terms of um, it, that in and of itself, aside from autism, um, and complementing the autism as far as making you more likely to be a victim. Now, then not only are you, are you more likely to be a victim, <laughs> um, but you also are less likely to receive um, uh, justice. And so many, many crimes against people with autism are, are not successfully prosecuted. Part of this is because of, of the credibility, well, stereotypes about credibility as witnesses um, in, in a court setting, you know, and a lot of ignorance out there about you know, whether or not an individual with autism, <clears throat> whether or not they have intellectual disability is able to be a good reporter. Um, and uh, you know, in my experience, and I, I think, um, there's research, for example, about um, the use of, of social, social lies, um, we call them uh, little white lies or social lubrication lies. <laughs> um, individuals with autism don't use these as often. Um, so in a way, even just thinking about the fact that a common concern um, as, as a parent for our kids is that they um, sort of don't know how to lie <laughs> should help defeat the, stere the stereotype about someone with autism as a credible witness. Um, and then in terms of the kind of flip side, individuals with autism, when they find themselves um, as the suspect in a criminal case, there are a lot of stereotypes about emotionality and aggression. One of the um, things that really prompted me to become interested uh, in this topic. Uh, I was a, a faculty member um, uh, for many years at the Yale Child Study Center and the young man who um, uh, carried out the Newtown shootings had been um, assessed there prior to my time, but um, we were all very um, involved in the, uh, not only just living in that community, are living near that community, but also because our, our center was involved in assessing um, that young man, and that's uh, part of the public record, so I'm not uh, giving away anything there that, that's private or confidential. Um, but with that case, because he had been given a, a diagnosis on the autism spectrum, um, there were so many news reports and a lot of questions about, well, you know, is individuals with autism more likely to carry out these types of um, mass shootings and you know we had to really emphasize and, and argue against those stereotypes because while that was a horrific 
occurrence, um, you know, again, most individuals with autism much more likely to be the victims of um, violent or nonviolent crime, and um, much seemingly much less likely to be the the actual perpetrators. So that was a, a case that, <coughs> you know, for obvious reasons, hit home for everybody, but particularly given the proximity um, and the involvement of, of my center in that, um, it raised a lot of questions for me that I then went out and tried to find um, answers to in the literature. So, okay, kind of giving you that as a background, sort of setting up the, the problem, if you will, or the, the set of concerns. Um, and now what I want to do is, is just tell you, you know, what I hope to accomplish as we have this conversation and hopefully will generate a lot of great questions and discussions. Um, so for those of you that are fairly new to autism, um, that might be popping in on this webinar as part of, a, of, you know, the criminal justice system, um, helping you to understand signs and symptoms of autism. And then for our, our researchers and our community, um, helping to focus in on the aspects of autism that would be particularly relevant to um, advocating for individuals with autism in the criminal justice system. So talk about that a little bit. I've already hinted at some of the unique vulnerabilities. And here again, trying to um, draw your attention to aspects that um, we as a field and uh, individual researchers or parents um, could do a, a much better job of, of helping to um, educate others if we kind of focus in on these unique very vulnerabilities. Then um, offering some um, tentative advice about understanding and managing maladaptive behaviors in, in legal settings, sort of the, the basic things that um, uh, should be taught or should be recommended um, for individuals who um, find themselves uh, uh, interacting with individuals with autism in the, the criminal justice system. So attorneys, um, lawyers, judges, um, uh, advocates, social workers, um, you know, have, how to actually manage some of the um, behaviors that will lead to, to more and more trouble, less justice um, in these legal settings. And then hopefully with, with those um, kind of points being made, that'll put us all in a better um, position to be the best possible advocate for um, autistic people in the criminal justice system. When I've <clears throat> talked with, um, given this talk or had this discussion before, it's often been focused on, um, talking with attorneys, um, equally defense attorneys and um, prosecutors, and you know, really their job, whichever side um, of that equation they're on, is to be the best possible advocate um, for, for their, their side, their client. And so helping them to understand as much as possible about autism and autistic people um, seems to be, to me a really um, useful um, endeavor and it occurs to me even a, as I listed all the people that are um, you know kind of involved in the criminal justice system I think I forgot to mention police and so you know that um, it obviously is a, um, a dumb oversight on my part um, because really that's where um, the, the first encounters always are um, and so we um, are, are very interested in, and I've been part of different trainings of, of police officers on you know, sort of what to um, be on the lookout for, how to understand autistic individuals, and at both as potential um, subjects of investigation, as well as, um, again, more often victims of a crime, and, and how to take into account different aspects of autistic behavior. And so we'll talk about that quite extensively. Okay, I feel a little silly um, showing you the diagnostic criteria for autism, but um, I think it's necessary given probably the, um, 
the mixed audience. And so you probably well know that um, autism is a, a um, behaviorally defined condition. And we talk about autism um, spectrum disorder being pr um, present when there are persistent deficits in social interactions, we're looking at the quality of reciprocity and nonverbal communication and um, problems in understanding or maintaining relationships. And um, this, is, of course, is a spectrum condition. And so, and I'll talk more about what that means. Um, also present at the same time are restricted repetitive behaviors. And um, these can be um, ranging from very um, simple kind of um, repetitive motor behaviors to uh, very complex cognitive rigidity. Um, but still um, both kinds of, of behaviors or patterns of acting fall under the um, idea of restricted repetitive behaviors. And so um, that's something you can, your imagination might already be running wild with ways that that could um, interact with the criminal justice system. And several of the real life case examples that I'll show you um, are related to that, so. Um, Symptoms have to be present early in development. They're clinically impairing, um, not more easily explained by a broader intellectual disability. And this isn't just a occasional um, set of, of, of differences. It's really a persistent set of, of differences in social interactions across multiple contexts, okay? And we talk about autism as a spectrum condition, a lot of times what um, an element of what people mean by that is level of cognitive functioning, kind of interacting with autistic symptoms. And so um, the, the two interact and um, there are individuals with autism at every point along the IQ continuum. Um, you know, you see here from um, a lower intellectual ability to higher intellectual ability is measured by um, an IQ test. And so it's important to understand that um, you could be meeting a person with autism and they could be anywhere along this continuum. Um, statistically speaking, they're probably going to be around the average of the continuum, uh, as is everyone else you meet, um, even, uh, even on a college campus. Um, and just sort of the way IQ works. And so um, I think regardless of the intellectual functioning of the individual, it's important for um, legal, people in legal systems to understand that a diagnosis of aut autism always still signals the presence of something to be concerned about with regard to helping that person um, um, engage in their rights, either as a victim or as a potential perpetrator. Again, regardless of how cognitively able they are, that autism still brings with it certain vulnerabilities in a, that are particularly sharp in a legal setting. Um, so I hope that I Hard, obviously on a webinar, I can't really look at you and see if you're understanding what I'm saying, but um, I think that's an important point to make. And it's, it's often missed, you know, it's like, oh, they seem really smart. I don't see what the problem is. And it's like, well, it, it's not that it's a problem. It's a vulnerability, and especially in a legal setting um, that certain aspects of the autism phenotype can lead one to be very, very vulnerable. So. I wanted to show you, and I'll warn you, this is actually a really difficult video to watch. I have permission to show these, um, these two videos, <clears throat> but I just wanted to illustrate how, you know, when we talk about autism um, spectrum disorder, how wide the continuum is by showing you two very different um, versions of autism. So uh, I'll warn you, it's hard to watch. And I, sorry, I pressed the button before I could tell you it was loud. So 
this young man um, uh, has very, very little um, um, speech, um, has a lot of um, uh, self-interest behaviors, has a lot of repetitive self-interest behaviors. And so um, his level of intellectual functioning um, is very difficult to gauge and you know, his level of adaptive functioning is, is very, very um, low. Now contrast this with this young Hi, Dean. Hi. We're here today to ask you what it feels like to have Asperger's syndrome. So can you tell me, how old are you and what grade are you in? 10 and 5th grade. And I understand that you have Asperger's. Can you tell me what that is? It makes me think differently. And can you tell me one great thing about having Asperger's? I'm smart. Is there something you don't like about having Asperger's? No, no, no. And how many brothers and sisters do you have? I have one brother. How old is he? Nine. And what type of things do you like doing together? Going on the computer, playing soccer. Do you wish that your brother had Asperger's? Yes. Why? Because I, he's also smart. If he had Asperger's, how would he be different? He would like history. He is my science advisor. I understand that your passion is history. Can you tell me which particular topics you're interested in? The age, the age of discovery. Favorite person from the age of discovery is Copernicus. Well, what can you tell me about him? He, he, he was the, the Polish astronomer who concluded the sun, not the earth, is at the center of our solar system. Tell me something about the modern world that you like. Vote for women. Women got the right to vote in 1920. Really? Who helped that law come into effect? Susan B. Anthony. She lived from 1820 to 1906. I, hear um, I could let that play for hours. It's fascinating. In a couple of minutes, he talks about the, um, the, his knowledge of the um, alcohol um, problems that various members of par parliament have. <laughs> and so, you know, I think you get the idea of two very, very different presentations, but um, even still, and, and very different vulnerabilities, but there's a shared space of vulnerability. And uh, you can imagine um, ways in which that either child could confuse or um, really surprise and, and um, raise concerns in, in a legal setting. Um, either via you know the, the second young man's very very um, restricted interest in different aspects of, of history, and then the first young young man's um, really inability to communicate. And um, if you saw him and knew very little about psychology, very little about autism, you just saw him in a flash, you you wouldn't be certain what you're seeing and might think you know oh well, this is somebody. Um, having a you know a really bad temper tantrum and not really understand that that's an aspect of his autism, um, and you know that that it doesn't quite fit the meaning of what we usually call a temper tantrum, even though it's just a a moment's glance you think maybe that's what that is. And so um, summarized some of the um, different aspects of autism that might be particularly relevant. This is. Um, just uh, me breaking my own rule about the amount of text on a slide, but I just wanted to to make sure um, you know what I'm thinking of as the the kind of common ground across the spectrum that's really important to remember for legal settings. That, that often facial expressions and body languages um, body language isn't going to reflect internal states or emotions. Um, this is one that um, often gets my daughter in trouble. Um, may have memorized whole segments of language and movements from movies and television. Um, there's time I can tell you about her um, when asked about being angry at, at a friend, she recites kind of a whole um, 
badass moment from a movie about what um, she would like to do to the friend and had the teacher not known that that was like straight from a movie about you know beating up and um, the friend then you know she wouldn't have realized that it's she's not it's not quite the same thing as coming up with it all on her own even though it was expressing a feeling of anger nonetheless but um, fortunately that ended up being funny instead of getting her in lots and lots of trouble. Um, a social naivete that doesn't match other areas of intelligence. Um, so you can have, for example, the young man I, I just showed you who's very, very smart, but socially naive. Um, and uh, this is a big one in terms of a, a lot of interactions with um, police officers when we're doing trainings and we talk to police officers, you know, that when someone isn't making eye contact with them in a typical way, and we know that autism, you know, a major feature of it is not using eye contact in a typically social way, that that means, well, are, are you being misleading? You know, are you trying to um, tell me a lie or are you uncomfortable right now? Um, and delay in processing, you know, the sort of taking too much time to answer a question sometimes perceived as being dishonest as well, um, as can be um, having too much anxiety or, or dysregulation, which is the next thing I want to uh, mention. And um, you know, this one is, is not a defining feature of autism in terms of a diagnostic defining feature, but um, aspects of emotion dysregulation um, are or in my experience, the number one concern of, of parents, maybe right after um, you know, using language and being able to communicate. And so the, these tantrums and refusal, aggression, self-injury, um, you know, the vast majority of our kids experience this and often um, have features of this well beyond the developmentally appropriate stages um, another thing that got me very interested in this topic from a personal perspective was <coughs> I was um, I was pulled over um, in in our hometown and my daughter and I were on our way to um, build a bear and she had earned through very good behavior and doing um, and, and being nice. I think that summer it was trying to be nice to her brothers. Um, she had earned a trip to build a bear and um, I was pulled over. She was in the back because she she liked to sit in the back. It was a little unusual. She was too old to really be um, sitting in the back, but um, she was. And she was very upset because we needed to be back home in time. Um, and in her experience, um, getting pulled over means a ticket, which means money, which means maybe she wouldn't be able to go to build a bear if I had to use the money to pay the ticket. And so she was having tantrums and, you know, really, really, really upset. But she was, um, from an outside perspective, way too old to be doing that. Um, so the police officer was quite taken aback to the point where, you know, he, he kind of instructed her to stop. And she really wasn't, she wasn't going to, you know, without, um, more help than that. And I, I felt like I couldn't really move from the front seat. And, and at so one point he actually put his hand on his pistol. Um, and I, I was sort of shocked by like, okay, I'm really sure where you're going with this and explained to him that she has autism, which made her even more upset because she hates it when dad does that, you know? And so anyway, um, I can imagine all the ways, you know, my daughter, um, small frame, five foot three female um, who doesn't look like she could really hurt anyone, but imagine if she were a six foot tall, um, you know, young man and having those same types of, of tantrums, you can imagine how things would, would become very scary and, and dangerous very fast. Um, in a setting where a police officer doesn't really understand anything about autism. So, um, in terms of the types of things that we teach, it won't surprise the clinicians on, uh, on, the, um, on the Zoom call at all. 
Um, you know, we, we really emphasize visual supports for everything. Here are the visual supports that I have shown up are what we use to help kids get through MRI scans and help um, um, attorneys and, and judges, um, you know, think about using the same sorts of things to help get through legal proceedings and police officers to help um, someone get through an interview um, if they're, you know, a victim and provide testimony about what happened, you know, and we emphasize, of course, um, uh, really showing instead of just telling, um, make the situation concrete, model and demonstrate. This is a tough one when we talk to attorneys about this. It's like, well, at what point are you, if, if for example, that they're a um, victim, you know, how much are you guiding their testimony? And this is, just a very fine line and best done by um, a well-trained advocate who can work with the different legal um, uh, professionals to accomplish their goals of, of getting you know, justice done, but then do so in a way that's maximally comfortable um, and, and maximally adjusted to what the individual with autism can do. And the same with language strategies, um, which you know, are all related to um, helping both the, the folks you know, in the court um, uh, get and, and convey information, but also um, for police officers to be able to really handle and interact with situations that they might have very little experience with just a few simple suggestions that um, most anyone can learn. And in my experience, um, when presented with the, this information, uh, police, police officers in particular have been incredibly open to it, grateful for it, related it to things that they've done for years, and then you know, utilized it and, and with good outcome. Um, one that can be difficult to control, um, a sensory environment, you know, anyone that's ever been to um, your local courthouse, you know, um, it, it's just not a, a sensory friendly place necessarily. Um, but again, in, in setting up ways to interact with um, people with autism and bring about maximal comfort, you know, this, these are just a few suggestions and most of these um, we adapted from helping um, different medical settings, particularly um, Northern Virginia and Nova has a um, autism friendly um, ch uh, kid child ER that we helped design. And you know, these were the sorts of, of things that we tried to implement throughout just a few of the principles. Um, let's see. Okay. Now, I've already mentioned um, my personal experience with, with sort of being pulled over and having an autistic child in the car. Um, and it, everyone's had, had, you know, the experience of, well, many of you have probably had the experience of, you know, lights come on in the rear view mirror and your heart um, kind of goes into your throat. And, you know, again, emphasizing that for individuals with autism, that is a very demanding, for everyone, but individuals are in a very demanding social setting, social situation that they're having to deal with and that added anxiety that they, they commonly bring um, to every situation could make them look um, you know, very suspicious, um, you know, not making eye contact, um, not picking up on the social cues that the officer is giving, um, you know, not kind of um, engaging in friendly chit chat and back and forth. And the next thing you know, um, you have an officer who's very concerned that they're dealing with something that, that they don't really understand here. Um, so it, it's a all too common occurrence. So it was one very um, tragic situation. I believe it was in Rico County um, where a young man was um, in a park and an autistic young man and he, he tended to go for walks there pretty frequently but he wasn't well known to the police department and they thought he um, might be um, 
high on drugs because of some um, kind of self-stimulatory behaviors he was doing, um, a lot of kind of sniffing his hands and um, stuff like that and walking in circles. And then when they approached him, uh, he didn't really respond and things escalated and um, they thought he was trying to run away and you know, it ended up as a police shooting. And so, you know, it's hard to imagine the chain of events that led to that. Um, and it's certainly not the um, autistic young man's fault. Um, I don't remember the outcome of that case for the police officers, um, but it was, you know, tragic all the way around and um, could be easily avoided by just some alternative hypothesis testing about you know, what am I looking at right now? Um, anyway, no. uh, this is a more of a, um, an example of someone who has very high levels of intelligence, but very um, un kind of unusual uh, restricted repetitive interests, so. Here's your list of charges. You hacked into the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Department of Defense, and NASA, amongst other things. Why? I was in search of suppressed technology, um, you know, laughingly referred to as UFO technology. I think it's the biggest kept secret in the world because of its comic value. Um, but it's a very important thing. We've got old age pensioners can't pay their fuel bills. Um, we've got countries being invaded um, to get award oil contracts to the West. And uh, meanwhile, secretive parts of the secret government are sitting on uh, suppressed technology for free energy. So how did you go about trying to find the stuff that you were looking for in NASA, in the Department of Defense? Well, I assumed that although it's part of a secret government project, there must be military ties. Um, I'd read 400, 400 expert witness testimonies, um, ranging from civilian air traffic controllers through military radar operators. So it's kind of funny, given recent news developments from the Times and um, the reports from fighter pilots off of Virginia Beach and San Diego, now this doesn't seem quite as far-fetched maybe, but um, this uh, young man, incredibly brilliant in terms of being able to um, work on computer systems and his re restricted repetitive interest was UFO technology and he followed his passion and broke into um, some computers that were thought to be, or systems that were thought to be um, unbreakable. And he, of course, got in quite a lot of trouble. Um, it was a, kind of a famous case. I think Uta Frith ended up writing, um, writing this case up in a really brilliant way. Um, we will share the PowerPoint and in the notes I have um, links to uh, more detailed stories about these different cases and this one's particularly interesting to look at so that's an example another example of restricted repetitive interests um, i've run into a couple of young people who have been just fascinated with um, train schedules and trains in, in general and that's such a common one it's it's almost a stereotype but in this case one that seems to be that comes up a lot, but this young man was arrested for um, kind of commandeering a um, metro um, train in, in the DC Baltimore area. And you know, his restricted repetitive interests were these trains and it led him to, um, to get closer and closer and arrested several times and you know, into a lot of trouble. Um, based on pursuing that restricted repetitive interest, autistic young man, and you know, there was a lot of sympathy on the one hand. Um, he didn't hurt anyone, he did a good job um, having lived in DC for a little while. I think he probably did a better job um, navigating the trains than some of the train conductors, but he nonetheless, you know, rightfully so, got in trouble for commandeering one <laughs> and, and just, piloting it. And so, um, but I think these are, are all kind of the last two cases, they're sort of feel good cases and, and we kind of laugh maybe. Um, but then there's some where um, uh, 
you know, you could, you start to really get a kind of an icky feeling no matter how open-minded you are and, and wanting to be of assistance. So for instance, Uta Frith writes about, um, you know, this um, young man who carried a set of police handcuffs so that he can make a citizen's arrest if he spotted an unlawful behavior. You know, there's quite a few um, young people on the spectrum who um, have fascinations with aspects of law enforcement and um, there, where we don't have to imagine ways that that could play out into um, uh, behavior that, that can be tragic or, or very, very challenging. So and then this one, just so that I'm not showing you kind of easy cases, you know, as a, as a father of a daughter, um, this young man had a lot of um, restricted and in, in repetitive interest in um, women's undergarments. And he, it led him to, um, you know, just be kind of walking around the neighborhood and a door was open and he stole some underwear from um, a, a um, young woman's um, drawer. And so he was arrested and, you know, the, the, it's interesting to kind of read the case notes on this because the prosecution is saying, you know, look, we figured out this person has a lot of issues. Um, we're talking about having autism. Um, if they aren't treated, put the public at risk. So we want the person to go to jail, you know, and, and that's where they can get treatment. And it's like, I think we all know that's not um, for any mental health condition, you know, that's not a likely place to get treatment. And so the defense, you know, was saying, well, really needs an opportunity for rehabilitation and, and getting help. And we agree and, you know, psychological issues, talking about the autism. And so very different recommendations. And uh, he was sentenced to quite a long time. Um, and while in jail, you know, he was, was beaten very badly, suffered a, a broken cheekbone, fractured eye socket, um, and repeatedly, um, you know, beaten. And I, you know, I tell this story not to, to really <clears throat> bring you down, but to, to say, you know, I can present some sort of fascinating, quirky stories. And then there's ones where you're like, well, geez, what do we do? Because, you know, it's this person stole some underwear. He made the young woman feel incredibly vulnerable and uncomfortable. And, you know, we can't, um, we've got to do something about this and, and kind of, well, what are the different options? And unfortunately, our prison system is really a one size fits all. And, and if you're an individual with autism, social vulnerabilities, prison is going to be extra brutal um, in, in almost every situation. So, okay. Last um, piece of this, I wanted to, um, talk about concept of uh, that's coming into the minds of many um, uh, in who serve as prosecutors thinking about you know true criminality versus counterfeit what they call counterfeit deviance you know so in the example of the young man who stole the underwear um, the inability to really appreciate and I don't mean a lack of empathy okay but I mean the inability to appreciate how that could be seen and how that could make someone feel very vulnerable. Um, you know, the victim of the crime, the person whose house was, was walked into and this um, undergarment stolen, you know, versus um, doing the same behavior, well aware of how that might make someone feel and not caring, you know, the, the kind of a callousness or even wanting to make someone feel terrified by doing that. And, you know, those are two very different crimes in a way, even though from the perspective of our legal system, they're both breaking and entering, um, stolen property, uh, and, and potentially a sex crime. And so that um, comes into play quite a bit. And I'll leave on the idea that one of the reasons why prosecutors are thinking about this quite a bit is with, with the internet age and the, the ability to, to, for there to be a number of different kinds of crimes that can happen by virtue of what young people are looking at online or what they're sharing, 
this idea of, of counterfeit deviance um, is coming into play quite a bit and has to be um, considered. And uh, this was just, I always, uh, you know, there's so many things out in the world that kind of um, give you, uh, if you're someone who relishes logic and, and clear thinking, you know, there's so, and, and you're kind of rigid or literal, um, which can be great qualities. <laughs> There's so many things out there in the world that can give you mixed messages like this sign um, that, you know, imagine trying to navigate the world where this isn't a joke, but this is instead um, like why, you know, you're trying to figure this out as a problem and kind of remember the, you know, 2000 movie 2001 Space Odyssey, where how the computer was given conflicting um, orders. And so he threw all the astronauts out in the airlock. Um, you know, I think that this idea of trying to navigate the criminal justice system, which in many ways is a very black and white system, um, uh, no pun intended um, there, but a very rigid system, but then sends conflicting messages constantly and is, it has an overlay of um, both our knowledge of autism and, you know, kind of political winds. Um, that I think you know, it, it can be mind numbing um, in terms of, of what to do from there. So I'll stop there and, um, and take some questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Palfrey. Um, that was a really fascinating presentation. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Genevieve and she's going to ask some of the Q&A that we have had coming in. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Palfrey. What a timely and such an important topic. Um, I'm glad that you were able to present to us today. So we've had quite a few questions coming in as you've been talking. So one of them is specific to Virginia. Do you know of any Virginia police departments that have ongoing training programs um, for them to learn how to spot an individual with a disability or an individual with autism? Um, Virginia Beach does. Um, I know that just because my family um, lives here. And um, let's see, I don't know about Charlottesville. Um, do, does anybody on the line know about Charlottesville? We could probably I don't, that but that happen. is definitely something we should look into. Yeah, I bet they would be open to it. Um, and then um, uh, Henrico County does. Um, and those are the three that I, well, two that I know of. Okay, great, thank you so much. So in talking about interacting with even just first responders, there are a lot of devices that are out there, such as the autism ID card or other alarms that families um, can have for their child. Have you ever seen any of those to be helpful in preventing these issues from escalating? Oh, for sure. Um, although, and it depends on the, the set of issues. So for some issues, the, those can be very, very helpful. Um, especially if, if the person is a victim of a crime, if they're um, lost and encountered by um, a first responder, um, all, all of those types of situations that can be very helpful. It might be less helpful in situations where an individual with autism is, is very um, upset, showing a, a lot of um, um, what, what people might perceive as very aggressive behavior just because of the distances involved, it's not gonna be as helpful. And I fear that, you know, compound that with kind of social distancing and COVID and it could be even worse because you don't have that opportunity to kind of get up close enough to notice either a wristband or, um, uh, you know, somebody sharing a card with you. And reaching for sense. a card could be um, potentially very dangerous. Uh, so weird to say that, but yeah. Right. It's a, it's a weird time that we're all in right now. So that's a good point that you made the distance that everybody's taking. Um, so if you are um, a parent that has concerns that their child with autism may come in to contact with police or first responders that may not respond well, how do you start talking to that child about the world and, and things that they should do? I think um, one of the things that can be very valuable um, Virginia Beach hosted a um, kind of a first responders clinic 
um, it was uh, put on um, primarily by Autism Speaks, um, but the, the police were there, the uh, fire department, um, emergency medical service, and <clears throat> that was a great opportunity to take um, young people with autism or to accompany young adults with autism and introduce them to the different types of first responders and um, get questions answered and just get a comfort. And then that allowed, um, imagine as a first responder during that day, probably if a thousand, let's say a thousand people came, I think it was close to that. You know, it's like 750 different examples of people with autism. And that's a great sample to get you started on well, what might this look like and what are all the things that can come up and um, allowing it. And then as a parent, that's a perfect time to have conversations about how to handle traffic stops. Um, if, if that's a relevant feature, um, if your young person is going to be driving. Um, but how to handle interactions with police if you're writing mass transit, what to do if there's a, um, an emergency around you, um, you know, how to get help. Um, I think that was a fantastic experience. And so taking advantage of experiences like that um, and they're becoming more and more common um, can be terrific. And if you're a parent who has, you know, kind of the energy and, um, the, the uh, outgoingness to contact the local police department, even if you don't have a, um, a fair that's gonna happen in your town, um, anytime soon, you could, you could schedule a mini one. Um, and it can be, I think it would also be great to do that in the context of schools more generally. And that way it doesn't have to just be for, um, you know, individuals uh, on the spectrum. Um, you think about high schools, for example, you know, you're, you're, most of your interactions with police are going to be with the a few officers that are assigned there to, you know, make sure people don't misbehave during lunch and kind of um, come back on campus. And if I think if my main experience with a police officer was the um, guy who was in charge of making sure we weren't smoking in the um, parking lot, you know, it, it, it actually bred a bit of contempt and feelings of he's incompetent more than any respect. And so I think having police more active, not as investigators or um, surveillance, but as just here's what police do and here's how to interact with us and get to know, you know I think that could be a really good thing. I think that's a great idea. And kind of on that vein, we have some service providers or other people in the, the field that want to get more information about um, autism in the criminal justice system. Do you know of any resources that they could access? I can pull some together. I can pull together a list um, and, uh, and they're welcome to shoot me an email um, if they have specific areas that they want to target for that, I can help point them in the right directions. I'm kind of constantly looking for things myself. I keep like a little folder on my desktop of stuff. So some of it I can vet and say, yeah, you know, I, I, I've read through this, but if I can, I'll tell you that if I haven't looked at it myself. That's great. Um, and all the resources that you can find, we can probably put most of those on Autism Drive so people can access them through that website as well. Great. Um, so I think we have time for one last question. So uh, an individual is asking, how would they go about educating criminal justice personnel on autism without offending them or maybe talking down to them? Um, do you have any approaches that they could use? Yeah, you, in my experience, they're not offended. I, I've never met, um, speaking about police officers and, and lawyers as well, judges, They've never been offended um, by, and I, and I don't think it's some quality I have of being able to convey information without offense. You know, I think they really like learning about stuff that'll be helpful to their job. Um, 
and, and so uh, the only suggestion I would make is, is don't do it in a heated context or an argument. Um, do it in advance of those types of things happening. Um, and in general, they're very, very open to it. And if you run across one that isn't, don't give up. Um, you know, there, I bet there will be six or seven of that person's friends who, who are open to hearing about it and, and it'll get back to them and they'll all start to, to really be thinking about this. That's great. So if it worked for you, it should work for everybody. That's awesome. <laughs> No fear, just help educate everybody about. Yeah, and then, you know, the worst case is that you, you offend them, but it, you know, it, I, I think the, that's a low risk. I don't think it's gonna happen very often. That's great, that's good to hear. So we received so many more questions, Dr. Pelfrey, but we have run out of time. If you have a question you would like us to get it to Dr. Pelfrey, feel free to email star dash autism at virginia.edu and we will go ahead and, and get that answered for you. I'll turn it back over to Moira. Great, thank you, Jenny. Um, so today's presentation concludes our summer series of virtual live events. We're gonna resume monthly communications with our STAR e-newsletter in September. So if you haven't already, be sure to sign up to receive it. And we have a couple of slides where I can show you how to do that. Uh, we want to announce that the Autism Hope Summit, it's our annual conference for self-advocates, family members, care providers, and researchers, and we're going to hold it virtually this fall. So keep an eye out for additional information about the 2020 Virtual Hope Summit coming soon. You can also find us on Facebook at Autism UVA, and as Jenny mentioned, autismdrive.virginia.edu, if you're not familiar with it, Autism Drive is a great resource. It's a centralized database of resources for individuals, families, and professionals um, all over the Commonwealth of Virginia. So thanks again, Dr. Palfrey, for that great presentation today. Um, we appreciate everyone joining us. And again, as Jenny said, if you didn't get your question answered, you can email us at star-autism at virginia.edu. So you'll hear from us next in September with our monthly newsletter and more details about all of the great things we have going on on grounds this fall. So thanks again for joining us. We hope everyone has a great afternoon. Great, thank you.